So how's it going to work? Uh, each, each one of us got to introduce ourselves. You have like a talk about document, but if you want to talk to them, don't ask you from them like one question and they wouldn't turn over to you, right? So, so I'll go first. My name is Jason Cavanis, um, retired Army officer, been in tech some kind of way since 2014. And each one of us is going to have like a different perspective on like the entrepreneurship. This, my perspective is like, it's not unicorns and rainbows, right? This, this shit freaking sucks, right? Like you have to be, you have to be mentally strong, right? You know, maybe you're lucky and you'll start, start a company two months later, you have to be a billionaire. Well, odds are you're not right. So I'm just so stuck out, right? So when you start your company, you can get a lot of advice, some good, some bad. But you got to remember it's from their perspective, right? What worked for me might not work for you, you know, and vice versa, right? So keep advice, you know, with a grain of salt. And another thing, too, you're going to go through a lot of people, right? No one's going to have your, like, your drive, you know, that you want to succeed, right? It's going to be like, it's your idea, your passion. Even with someone's like your co-founder, they might not be as passionate as you are, right? So I keep that in mind. Also, you get like, a lot of advice. A lot of people offer you to do stuff. But but I would say if someone wants you to pay for it, don't do it right. Like when someone says, hey, Jason, pay me $5 a month, I, I, I'll let you make you pitch, right? Don't do it right. One mistake I made is, is a lot is like paying for stuff we're not going to have, right? Like you might have to think, I don't know, I really don't do a sales platform, but man, it's six months free. Let me pay this money. Six months later, you never use it. And you're going to be on $30 a month. That, that stuff adds up, right? Um, and it's, you got to be in it for long, long term, right? And make sure you take care of yourself, right? Everyone can be Elon Musk and work 120 hours a week, right? You got to, you know, you got to take breaks, right? You got to have a beer with your friends, do different things. Uh, another bit of advice would be like, if you're doing, if you're doing a startup, I would like work for another startup first, right? So learn how to do it, right? Now, of course, that's bad advice that the person in charge of startups is a jackass doesn't know what he's doing, right? So it's in myth. One thing I would like to like, whatever we tell you on the panel, like, use your own lens, like, like figure it out, right? Uh, I think what else? Um, how many of you know how to code? If you're, if you're a tech co-founder, you definitely have an advantage, right? I'm an tech founder. And these tech C people be they be freaking telling me, right? Like if you if you can if you can code, you have a big advantage, right? Whether it's fair or not fair. Um I'm sure I have some more stuff to say later on about pets on at Amy right now. Hello, my name is Amy Swanson. I am the CEO of Ultropia. Um Ultropia is a hard tech startup that is building an energy efficient washer and dryer. Um, my background is in electrical engineering. I'm currently a first year MBA student at the University of Washington Foster School of Business. Um, I really encourage you all as students right now to take advantage of all of the opportunities that you can engage in as students. Um, as a hard tech startup, it's a lot slower for us and we need the resources at the university. Um, honestly, to slowly build out a washer and dryer. You don't wake up every day and be like, I'm going to build an appliance. Um, and so we're, we're a lot slower, um, but there are the benefits of the university. Um, the first thing I would recommend is student pitch competitions. Um, our company won 12, 13 cash prizes from different student pitch competitions. We won first place in MIT's Climate and Energy Prize. Um, we won first place in UW's Global Innovation Exchange. Um, there's a number of competitions that are available to you as students. If you're curious about any of these student pitch competitions, please feel free to reach out to me and I can help you look at your pitch deck and help you navigate some of these processes. They will really, really refine your pitching and really, really help you um, understand what your value proposition is. Um, you are all studying entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you probably have heard of some of these competitions and I recommend for you to engage in them. Um, another thing that is available to students that I highly recommend is the National Science Foundation's Innovation Core program, um, which is also available. There's regional programs. There is probably a site program somewhere in your region that you can participate in. Um, usually you can participate in a 2,500 grant program that has you go through a customer discovery process. So you come with your idea. They have you interview 25 people just to validate your idea and put your hypotheses on a business model canvas. Um, if you have an idea, you want to get it as fail as fast as possible. And so do everything you can to see if people are interested in your idea, put all your assumptions on paper, and then and take it out to the world and see. A lot of people want to work on something in isolation. Don't, don't do that. Go work. You're at a university. Work with the people that you have on hand. You're paying tuition. It's so special to be around people in a similar mindset with you who want to create something lasting, 
um, because entrepreneurship is hard um, and you have access to these resources, so you should engage in them. Say I form? Yes. Or hub and I'll really have a Oh, yes. Please, please do I hope. It is amazing. Uh, shout out to that. We also recently did the national program of i as well. And so if you participate in the site core, then you can also participate in the national program, which is a $50,000 grant that's associated with 100 interviews. And even if you just do 100 interviews, not through a program at all, the number of connections that you'll walk away with. Um, we talked to people in the government who told us, hey, like the government would be interested in an energy efficient washer and dryer. We, have, we would be able to pay for it if these buildings wanted to transition to it. We talked to developers who told us about the problems they were facing. And so you'll find a place in the market where your product fits. And so go and explore these programs. The other program I would like to promote for students is VentureWell, um, which I think is also affiliated with, um, I think in universities, uh, the government, but I think it is its own private organization. Um, you need to find a department chair who wants to support you, a PI who wants to support you. Um, as well as get the sign off from your financial department, um, which is something that I think you're all capable of. And it's good steps to go through and get these buy-ins from people. And because you'll need to do this as you go and you start forming a corporation and it can test a lot of your assumptions early on. Um, VentureWell is a $20,000 grant program where you interview some customers, they have a workshop um, and then a longer customer discovery portion. And so take advantage of these resources and really like try to invalidate your ideas as early as possible. Um, as well as work with people, like if you're not a technical founder, there are people at these labs in your universities who are creating some really, really excellent research that sometimes doesn't see the light of day. And you can go and you can work with these people at these labs and who need this entrepreneurial side to bring these, um, these, their innovations to the public. Um, I think the person who won the MIT Climate Energy Prize did exactly that. I think she won it maybe seven years ago, and she has a new startup. She she found a really cool innovation at the university. She was like, hey, I want to take this through business plan competitions. Um, and then they were really, really successful. They had been working on the research for a long time, but they really hadn't thought of a commercialization strategy. And so there are so many people that you have the skills to partner with, even if you don't have maybe the technical skills, that you can work to really bring these innovations to the public. So engage with the resources at your disposal as a student. And please reach out to me anytime you have <laughs> About you got to follow up the request. Like Amy said, you got to put yourself out there, right? You can't build a product by yourself. I don't care how great the product is. You have to have someone to know about it, right? The other thing I would say, too, it's important for you to do, I knew this earlier, do sales, learn sales, right? Nothing, because everyone says tech is more important, product more important. I mean, sales is more important, right? Because you got to bring you got to bring your money, right? Nothing's more important. Sales. Yes, yes. And, yes. And, like, nothing, nothing's more important. So. And uh, as about Amy, Amy's probably the most positive person I know in my life, right? She admits positivity. All right, Byron? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I can't match that charisma, so I'm laying that right now. Um, so I'm Byron Robinson. I, uh, I own a, a small investment bank. We, uh, we broker debt and equity for startups, uh, emerging, emerging companies and, uh, the lower middle market. Um, I'm from Virginia. I'm from Virginia. I went to the University of Texas, uh, so I did sports, uh, I ran track there, went to the Olympics, uh, ran professionally, blah, blah, But the, the part that I, it seems like it's no big deal. Yeah, yeah I, I was Olympian, no big deal, you know. Well, I don't put much value in, in sports, to be honest with you. I mean, I do love my long run football team, unfortunately. Yeah, y'all beat us, uh, last too. I have to Cause it, it was at UT. I was there. Yeah. It's all good. Um, but no. So the reason why I don't like talking about the track part is because whenever I do, people put me into that box. But the truth is, when I was at Texas, outside of actually running track, and don't get, I was busting my ass, so I would be clear about that. I mean, you should already know to go to Olympics, you have to do unreal stuff. Um, but what people don't know is that I actually was working harder in business while I was running track when I was at UT, and definitely when I was running for Adidas uh, the four years afterwards. Um, so I was able to build like that, that, that groundwork to actually like launch my business. Uh, I had to take incredible amounts of risk. No one knew about it. I mean, you look from the outside, look it in, everything was just good. I mean, th things were okay. Don't get me wrong, but I, I wasn't living off my own money at any point of my track career, like at all. Um, I, I essentially leveraged that, started this company and we started with just commercial real estate and then branched out. And I can tell you more about that later. Um, but, 
I mean, imagine being an Olympian and an Adidas athlete at the at the height of your career and your physical prime and essentially taking all that. Not even what would you do if you had that kind of money? Be honest. Save I'm putting 200 grand in front of you right now, cash. First thing you do is buy a car. You're going to get a nice spot. All right. You're going to flex it on Instagram. All right. That, that's what you do at age, right? I mean, at least in that bracket, it's hard not to do it. Um, I'm not saying I'm Superman or like I'm better than you. I just happened to make that one decision that set me up, you know, uh, for when I got older. Um, so outside of like the actual training part, uh, so the way I did it was outside of not spending money every day, I would come home from training. So I'll train would be from eight, roughly 8 a.m. to about 3 p.m. We would fit in three workouts, do all that stuff. And then once I got back home, um, I would just read everything that I could on, on central banking, corporate banking, commercial banking, hedge funds, private equity, uh, anything finance related. Cause I always was interested in finance. Uh, but I didn't go to school for it. So that's why I'm kind of jealous of you guys for, having an entrepreneurship program at your school because the entrepreneurship program at my school went like this. I would go to class, fight with my teacher. Uh, I'll get put out and I just read the Wall Street Journal when I got to the track. Like that was my program. Um, so I'm, I'm jealous, uh, but I'm happy to hear that things are changing. And it's actually like, you know, resources to, to tap into that um, because it, was, it hasn't always been the case. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about my story. Um, I'm, no, I'm fast forwarding past a lot because you don't want to know about all the, I mean, trust me, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, there's going to be like the story of you have to sacrifice a lot of stuff. That's just part of the game. You know, like when I ran track, you have to sacrifice your physical body. That's just part of it. There's no way of doing, you know, X without, you know, without Y. It's just a part of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, if I had to summarize things for you guys, it was, I just, I ran track, I leveraged the money. Uh, I read everything that I could, and then I just took uh, extreme amounts of risk, started with just commercial real estate, and then branched outside of that actually recently. And then uh, it kind of took form of uh, an investment thing. Um, one thing I do want to say before I pass it off, though, is that when I got started, I didn't, well, to be honest with you, I always wanted to be an investment maker, but I knew how intimidating it was and how big of a thing that is to even say out loud. So I always kind of kept it. You know, I, I didn't really want to say it. And I definitely didn't want to go through a traditional route of like going through an investment bank as an analyst and then work my way up. I'm an entrepreneur. I can't take orders. So I just wasn't going to do that. Um, so I had to figure basically what's the quickest route for me to get there? What's the business model? What do I have to know? Um, and how can I do it without having to actually have to deal securities? That's a whole other uh, issue that we have to get into. Um, but that, if I'm to brag about myself, to, that resourcefulness is what you guys will have to, to tap into. Uh, and it never ends. I mean, I I have resources now. I'm not going to lie to you, but I still have to be more resourceful than the resources I have available if I want to keep pushing things forward. Um, so I hope that you're able to to get something out of that, or at least with my story, because uh, it's definitely been difficult. I mean, it, it's fun. Don't get me wrong. It, there's I live an awesome life. I don't want to lie to y'all. It's awesome. But... You know, when you're going to go that route, being an entrepreneur, you're ready to to really take on everything that comes with it. Because it is a lot. And it's never ending. After we get done here, I'm going to check my phone. There's going to be more stuff I have to deal with. <laughs> that's just part of it, you know? Um, so, yeah, that's me. And, yeah, thank you all. Yeah, one more thing about Pastor Rubik is, like, make sure you network, right? Let's say we're networking, like, post one of y'all, I connect one of y'all on LinkedIn, right? I'm going to help you, but someone, like, two, three, four deaf people down the line are going to help you out, right? So you got to have that circle, like, and so I'm Pastor Ruben. Uh, so like uh, Amy and Byron said, um, I think uh, I've started my journey uh, a while back, but I started working around like 15, 16 in high school. Um, I worked on weekends in the automobile industry, and then I was an intern for the city of Seattle. And then I ran a few of our clubs, including our student store in high school. So now I talk about it out loud. Now that I'm doing my own company. That's what it's like to be an entrepreneurship. I think you're always juggling things a lot. Um, and in the summer, uh, even though I was in the receptionist part of things, um, you know, there's always customer service. You always have to, as Byron has mentioned, you have to be res resourceful. Um, and I think in the automobile industry or anything, they talked about sales, right? You have to talk to people and you have to network, network. I can't emphasize that 
you know, how much relationships are everything, regardless of whatever industry you get into, or if you decide to get into entrepreneurship, you can always have to deal with people, um, regardless. And, um, so fast forward to now, uh, it'll be my fourth year. I own a staffing recruiting firm, but I also do event planning and utilize sports as a bridge to meet people where they are. Um, so imagine that, that you're working with hiring managers, right? But you're also looking for talent and a huge buzzword of what's happening now is diverse pipeline. You want to talk about diverse pipeline. You got to meet where people are. It's not in the traditional route anymore. It's not where people are. You can bring your resumes. Yeah, that's cool. But I think it comes down to relationships, relationships, relationships. Um, a huge example of that before COVID um, is that my company, we ran a basketball tournament, but we also had union companies there. We had UPS, we had USPS, we had Microsoft, so we had the non big nonprofits there. So while we had these people um, playing basketball and before the event would happen, is that, hey, spice up your, your LinkedIn profiles, bring up your resumes here. So when you are not playing in the tournament, you're gonna talk to these companies. You know, you're going to talk to the recruiters, build your relationships hands on. And um proud to say there was about three, four thousand people. And we were able to hire 25, 30 people in that event alone. Um, so with that to say, um you have to have a tough mental game when you're trying to get here. Right. Um I teach part time at a university, entrepreneurial. <laughs> I teach uh, business entrepreneurial, business planning. So what I'm learning now on the field is what I'm teaching my students at the university. I have a background in hardware engineering and an MBA as well. Um, so while I'm talking to you up here, it may look fun. There's the traveling part. I get to travel and talk to people and do my business, but. At the same time, it's sacrificing a lot of time with your family, a lot of time with your friends, um, and figuring out how to balance where your time is going. Uh, be intentional where you are going uh, with your time because the time of the essence is is really a big thing because um, you can't take it back. So uh, yeah, as like probably after this, I can feel my phone right now. I have my two business partners uh, doing this, but I also have a nonprofit. Um, that is in the community that has 50,000 people here in Washington State alone, but we're here in San Francisco. We're launching Detroit right now. We're in Austin um, and in Colorado right now. So uh, please talk to me after. Uh, there's a part of interviewing. There's your mock interviews. There's your resumes. But at the end of the day, it's people who people want to work with, and it's not what you bring to like what value add can you bring to these organizations or what you can bring to market uh product or service thank you all right and another thing for to take it to eddie ask for help ask yeah. people for help right even with some you don't know and you think they help you ask them right i mean don't get me wrong like some people are jackasses that's those right but you get to you got to pull it off right 90 percent of people are going to help you right some kind of way right and, and worst case scenario they're going to say no or send you a nasty note or ignore you right but you got to ask for help over and over again, right? Lastly, um, yes, don't be afraid to ask for help because right? we're not uh, going to be good at everything. I'm not good at math. I hate math. Uh, that's what I got my finance person on it. And um, But be able to not take anything personally if you get the no's and no one is willing to you know, give you the time or space. Um, and if they do give you the time and space, then you know, be respectful of their time and see how you can add value. Um, like I worked at the dealership, but in the summer, even though I was in the, the customer service side and service side, I asked my boss if I can go into the office because that's where you see your operations. It's like, yes, you sell the car, but there's so much more steps after that that happens. You have to go through finance. You have to go through accounting. You have to go through the office manager. Um, and you run elbows with you know the owner of the dealership and you just make relationships. I think that's your big one is to be able to meet people wherever you go. And Ruben's claim of fame is she believes she's the world's best aunt. <laughs> yeah, I have I have three nieces. Um, I, yeah, they 
and that's where I've kind of focused a lot of my time as my nieces. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Right. It, well, before I go ahead and introduce myself, I just want to echo just how, how important it is to, I would encourage you guys to build in public when doing that, you actually will discover who's in your corner and you'd be surprised how many people are there for you and how many people you don't know that by announcing to yourself the world that you're a problem solver are right behind you. They got your back. And me, so all that important. So I just received lots of crowdfunding campaign refunder and people I had forgot all about. Or, you know, sharing on, on social media, right? Like, I forgot to talk about these people and they're like sharing my stuff on social media because I've built a public like. So that's a good, good thing that you just said. Yeah, and that's just conceptually, you can apply that anywhere, whether it's entrepreneurship or whenever you're a true problem solver, you, you don't fix something just by thinking to yourself. You To get a holistic solution, you have to look at it all across the board. So do it, do it in front of others. Encourage others to um, participate. So anyways, uh, my name is Eddie Mazuregos. I'm the founder of a startup called Future Gen. It's an AI career discovery platform for Gen Z. You know, it's uh, it only took a year and a half, four pivots, three prototypes, until our team finally figured out, like, okay, no, we got something here. We're going to MVP this. So our team is very excited that we're going live next month. And yeah, thank you. Um, but you know, before doing all that, I was doing some. Um, Fun for some, maybe born to others. Uh, I, I was doing mergers and acquisitions as a management consultant. So I was you know, traveling across the world, seeing one hotel at a time. But I would say that that opportunity gave me I think, an immense insight into what I think became the bedrock of what came future gen. So every single time I had the opportunity to participate, volunteer, or design mentorship programs, career exploration programs, uh, company culture programs, I, I just jumped on it. And I had the opportunity of doing that in both company and university settings. And the lesson learned I got from that, and again, I'd say brought over the future gen, and is the problem area that we fell in love with, is what do you want to do in the future? It's such an easy question to ask, but hard to answer one. And so here at future gen, we really believe that it's a question that turns out to be fun when you're a little kid, excitement. It somehow gains this view of not found weight as you grow older. So how do we turn that around and remind each and every single one of you guys that it's, this is your story. It's your adventure. It's something to still be excited about. And so how we do that is essentially, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like traditional career assessments. Like they ask you like, do you love math? Do you love reading comprehension? And it tells you to become like a funeral director. You know? Yeah. Okay. Well, some of may, some of not. Well, our team hates them. <laughs> Um, we really truly believe that people are way more dynamic, interests change over time, and as you um, learn about more about yourself, you, you just become innately curious about everything else that's around you. And so the way that we go about this is we identify Gen Z uh, interests by pulling in um, social media videos. So we leverage TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and identify insights that we can then share with depending on the Gen Z or what stage they're in, their parent, their counselor, their teacher, or employers. So they can help them with the next best steps to continue with their innate, I would say, or I would say their uh, their own journey. So um, I got to say, you know, I, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an entrepreneur, you're truly a problem solver. Um, and by, uh, I can't say I knew what I was volunteering myself to, when I first did this, I mean, I remember my family telling me I was crazy. Uh, when I said, why, you know, October 1st, 2021, I resigned from management consulting. They're like, what are you doing? Um, first, you want to become a doctor. You went to a medical apprenticeship program at Harvard University. You made your parents so proud. And then you said, no, I want to do environmental science. Um, and then from there, uh, I went to UC Davis, which is a world-renowned school for environmental sciences. I graduated in finance. And so, uh, you know, I, I would say I was fortunate enough um, that during that time period in college, I asked myself, you know, how on earth does someone that loves medicine, that loves the environment, that loves finance make being me? Because at no point in time did I ever feel like I was wasting my time. And so, you know, I, I put my reflection cap on and I came up with what became my North Star, my guiding compass since then and moving forward which is I truly hope to become someone that's able to make 
decisions helping as many people as possible with long-lasting impact. And that's not a title, but it's my goal in terms of whenever I come to cross a fork in the road, is it getting closer to the goal or not? So um, I encourage you guys to always ask yourself why you're doing something. And is it is it that is that why you want to do it or is it from something else? Because when you are doing something that you truly have a deep passion for, everything becomes second and you'd be surprised how far you can go and how far you want to go. So um, I guess I'll share a little bit of my crazy story a, a little bit. Um, maybe we'll inspire you guys. You know, I don't, I come from an immigrant family, so I don't come from a family of all these entrepreneurs and stuff like that. You know, we came here um, and from a family just hopes that, you know, they want a better future for their kids. And, you know, uh, again, that year and a half or so ago, uh, when I resigned from management consulting, depending on who you asked, I was either crazy or a dreamer. And uh, since then, we've grown our team to eight others. You know, our CTO, he's a five-time founder, two successful exits. He went to his crowd of engineers and like, hey guys, want to do it again? Let's build. He brought them on board. You know, our chief science officer, which is in charge of our data analytics and science side, you know, he's a PhD educated applied scientist, um, you know, decades worth of work and research and workforce development, company culture, professional or personal development, um, with an emphasis towards you. Um, our designer, you know, I would say a reason why some people love our platform is because our designer, she's actually Gen Z. So Gen Z built for Gen Z, go figure. Um, and I would say something that happened more so recently was uh, our team actually went to, uh, started going announcing our fundraise. And so about seven weeks ago, we went into a exclusive due diligence process with an investment firm. We were raising $2 million at a 10 million valuation. And as of last Wednesday, we our team made a decision to exit from that boss. They didn't say no to us. They didn't say yes to us. We realized that the situation we put ourselves was potentially hurting us. And so, um, you know, in the last few months, our team has been able to do amazing things in terms of progress with the MVP. We've also been able to, we've been winning local awards for people choice awards and social impact, impact of thoughts. Um, and, you know, across the year and a half, we have been able to build an investment community that um, has been wanting to catch up with us. And so by them following us for the last two months and asking us what's been going on, I don't really want to tell them you have to hurry up and wait. Um, so we exited from that and it was, uh, our team then asked ourselves, what were the lessons learned from this and how can we put ourselves even to a greater position um, for, for the next steps, for the next race? And so we realized that our team has amazing capabilities in new product development and also R&D, but we did not have anyone who was instinctively sales and marketing. <laughs> um, you know, across a year and a half, we've been able to uh, develop a whole bunch of potential verticals. Um, that's a whole different thing I'll dive into. But we then asked ourselves, if we're able to go to the VCs again, we know it would be really killer if we're able to demonstrate new product development, R&D, and sales and marketing capabilities. So literally, last Friday or last Tuesday, it's Thursday. All right, days this kind of <laughs> fly by to me. Uh, we opened up a role for a chief revenue and marketing officer. We had over 200 applicants come in. And literally since Monday to today, minimally 12 or 15 calls a day talking to really amazing people um, who, you know, we're excited to potentially, uh, you know, as we're considering the next steps. And so, yeah, it's it's crazy. And as we continue to build in public um, and again, announce ourselves out there again, we're getting warm introductions to a lot of the local Seattle VCs and into our network again from the San Francisco area, um, Sacramento area. But anyways, um, as an investor, I, I cannot tell you, I knew that was going to happen or we're, we're going to be next year or year from now. So, so some that's exciting to others, that's, that's not for them. Um, so I'd encourage you to have that honest reflection upon yourself where you are in terms of, um, are you a founder or are you a supporter to make, uh, make a better world happen? So, uh, pass it over to you, Jason. In his claim of fame, his mother makes a bit of saladas in the world. 
Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so Amy, for you, so this is going to be a slight exaggeration, it's, you know, slight generic. So some people in the stock community will say, with a 90 day, you know, build an MVP, part of market fit, and have a million dollars in MMR, right? Other side of the spectrum, other people say, never quit. I don't care if you have 10 years, no product, no whatever, keep going, right? I've had this one in the middle. Like, what's your advice on that? Like, keep on going, quitting, pivoting, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I think if you know what your value proposition is, and it's a real value proposition, and it's something that you've tested, and you're seeing traction for it, I would stick with it. Um, I don't, I think people get these ideas in their head. It needs to be this fast or this long. You can put in, in limits for yourself. You need to eat. You need to survive. If it gets to a certain point, you can go get a job and do it on the side. Like that's know what your limits are and when you are not okay. And when you need to be like, okay, I need to put this aside right now. I need to take a break and focus on yourself. I wouldn't put any arbitrary number on it, like three months or like, it needs to be five years. We are hard tech. We're building a washer and dryer. It's going to probably take us like three, four years before we have an MVP. Like it'll be a long time. We've done some bench tests. We have these things. It's really, really good direction. So we have these, like the technology that we can point to, but before it's a product in someone's hand, it's going to be a very long time for us. And we're okay with that. And we know what our timelines are and we know where we're getting like our funding from. Um, the reason we're going to grad school is because we need that extra runway and we need the support of the university. And so you can find ways to get the support that you need in order to extend your runway, but don't put yourself on someone else's time scale. As long as you have a real value proposition, I would stick with it. Thanks, Amy. The bar for you. So is in the press you see on Coach Big, so and so startup raised ten million dollars, you know. It's all the myth of stir talk right out there. But most people are realizing stats, only one percent of startups actually have VC money. And that's not a guarantee of you, you know, being successful, right? And a lot of startups, oh, I have an idea. Let me go talk to VC, right? They have nothing right. From your point of view, when should a startup founder or small business owner try to get funding? Try to get funding? Um, I don't think you should go into business with the uh, with the goal of trying to get money. I mean, I literally sell money for a living. I'm telling you, I, if you're starting a business and you're saying, okay, day one, I want to do this so I can get this amount of money, you know, to be honest with you, you're probably going to quit because you're going to start getting the roadblocks and then you're not really passionate about it. It's just about the money and you just, you're not going to have the guts for it, to be honest with you. Um, and that's assuming that the money you, you get is even a good decision for you to make. Um, I think your first, your first goal should be, I'm not trying to pursue your goals, but I think your first goal should be, can I get this, can I deliver a good product first? Like, can I actually ship a product? Most people don't even, don't even ship a product. They kind of like, they'll, they'll listen to some podcasts, they read a few books, do an IG post, and kind of get the high off that. That's not ship a product. I would, I would focus on, can I ship a product? Can I do it well? Can I create a, a company, a culture? Can I cash flow? Can I keep the lights on? Like, you know, eat, put food on the table? Uh, I wouldn't worry about even trying to raise money. And I literally raise money for a living. It's just not, I think you should worry about raising money when you have years in the game and like you actually have expansion, you know, plans, you know, it's when you're more mature in the process. Um, now, of course, there are anomalies to that. Uh, we know that there are the unicorns and the, I know, like even like Eddie over there, like there are examples to where it makes sense. But if you're going into it, expecting to, to do that, you're probably not going to get to that point because your heart is not in it and you're going to quit. And that's the majority of startups, by the way. That's why they quit. Because they don't actually want to do it. They just want to get some money. If you want to get some money, go get a job. It's much easier to get money doing that, to be honest with you. Go to med school. Or, you know, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Can you understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. Okay. Environment's a good point. Like, if you have a startup, it needs, it needs, it needs, it needs to be something you have your passion for. Like, some, kind of some, some kind of problem you want to solve your passion about. You just start a startup because the AI is the latest hot thing, right? You're going to quit in three or four months because, like, this shit is hard, right? And if you're not passionate about it, you're going to have to drive to keep on going. They're going to quit sooner than that. Yeah. Like they're going to say, no one put me on. Yeah. I didn't get the handshake yeah. or yeah. the VC blew me off or, you know, it, it's going to be something like that. So they're going to quit much sooner than that. Too. By and the way, all that stuff is normal, by the way. Yeah. I mean, that's just part of sales. You're not going to land every client. That's just what it is. You know, if, if you have an issue with someone saying they don't like what you're doing and like it kind of affects you, you, you kind of get in your feelings about it. Listen, 
go serve coffee or something. Because I get it to this day. I got it this morning, actually. We're not going into detail about it, but it, and I would say by most people's standards, I'm a successful guy. And I, I still get it on a weekly basis. So like, if you don't have the heart for it, I'm glad you know it now and you didn't waste years of your life. Uh, I wouldn't be pessimistic though, because it is awesome, but you got to kind of just know what you're getting yourself into because it's, it's not just, just roses. Yeah. Another thing too, like a talk about being mentally strong, you're going to hear no like nine, nine or 100 times, right? You're going to hear no all the time, right? And sometimes, I mean, what's always going to be mean spirited? I mean, be honest, but most of the time, you know, it doesn't line up, you know, stuff is going on, right? But you can hear no a lot. You just have to get used to it. So we're going for you. So with startups and tech, a lot of people say no, only hire A top players, right? But, you know, how we're common, most A top players are starting their own company. They're going to pay a million dollars by Amazon. You know, A top players are kind of hard to find, right? So startup founders, like, try to, like, bring on B, B founders, make them A founders. Like, how could people bring, make their team? Uh, you have to enjoy the people you work with, but also know what strengths you bring to the table and what weakness you have compliment whoever you're looking for to bring on on the team. Uh, there will definitely be different personalities, who you, whoever you bring on board, because you may want one way of doing things. This person does things. I'll, I'll give you a prime example. One business owner of, or uh, one business partner of mine is uh, very A-type. The other one is all over the place. And then here's me in the middle trying to meet them here. I'm like, okay, I need, I get you, but I also get you. You need to figure out how to get down here on earth. And so, <laughs> because, you know, as a dreamer, I'm a visionary, but I'm also a dreamer, but I'm also realistic of how, like, you know, I'm a very results oriented person. So we have a timeline. You have to get it done. How, what will that make it happen? What? do we need to do as an organization, as a team to make it happen? And sometimes it may be outsourcing the little details and the admin stuff, or it may be outsourcing the marketing and everything. Sometimes you don't have the capacity to do it, but also you also don't have the funds to do it. So somewhere down the line is that you have to do things that you don't want to do and you have your weaknesses and you have your strengths. So you have to power play of like make this happen or this one will do this. Um, and if you don't get it, you have to look for help, find help somewhere because sometimes it's the service. Sometimes my services are needed and sometimes this organization may not have the funding, but there's services that I may need for my organization to make it work. So therefore there's the resourcefulness again. And sometimes it's not money all the time of supporting other people or organizations. It's like, how can you uh, make it work for yourself, but also make it work for me and make it work in the middle where you're not resenting me. I'm not resenting you because it's not working. And uh, if it's not working in the beginning of the time, then figure out a way how to communicate and make it work and see how you all can just flow because <laughs> at the end of the day, it's not um, going to be the rainbows and the happy, lucky charm and stuff. It's really hard work. And sometimes you're not sleeping. <laughs> and uh, by the way, you have to sleep get your rest in oh, mentally uh, because, you know, you have this hustle and everything, but you also have to really take care of yourself um, because if your cup is not full, you cannot be of service to other people. So, yeah. yeah. And so like, I don't know if you need to be married or whatever, but if you're married or like you have your close friends, they got to be your corner, right? Yeah. The last thing you need is like, you know, you have a group of friends and they'll go to New Orleans for the weekend. Hey, come on, go to the weekend. Let's go to New Orleans. You're like, man, I, I can't go. I got to do this whatever it is you get on, right? So your, your, your support, your, your close circle of friends, family, whatever it can be, they gotta be your corner, right? And it can't be, oh, I support you, that'd be like really actively supporting you, right? Yeah. So, so to that point, especially at your age right now, because you, you're surrounded by people who are just not focused and just not really, not really doing much. I mean, they worry about, you know, beach week and spring break and, you know, <laughs> this show and dumb stuff, right? They're not serious people. So, and you, you see it more when you're younger. 
you, you'll talk to them about, and if you're like me, I'm like, hey, did y'all, did y'all see uh, uh, that bridge loan that Disney just got? I'm a, I was, I'm a nut, you know, because these are big numbers and that, that's what interests me. And I'll tell some of my friends and they ain't give a damn, you know, they, they, they were talking about back then Overwatch, that's when Overwatch first came out. <laughs> and that's what they were thinking about. And so you have to make sure to what you said, uh, Jason, that you need to surround yourself with people who are who can see the light in you and is doing everything they can to to to, to bring it out of you. Because um, that's everything, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's everything. So Eddie, what do you? So you've done several pivots. My question was like, how do you know like when to stay the course? Like, man, let me walk. Well, come on, one, and and then when you're like, okay, this doesn't work, let me pivot. How does that thought process work? When you convince that your team not to kill you after you announce the pivot, no. <laughs> No, 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 uh, joking aside, um, just have to, uh, you know, I would say amongst the members of the team, I'm probably the, the great recognized dreamer. Um, and so I'm constantly at a point in time of just, uh, um, dream as I dream, they also help me bring things back down to earth, like what you were saying. And so at some point in time, since you hit a wall and when you hit a wall, uh, I'm not saying just give up right away, but just maybe try to think about it again. So just as a light example, you know, our first idea was we we're hearing everybody needs guidance. Like and it's something I truly believe then and do now that I think people have immense passion and drive and guidance can go a long way in supporting that. Um, so you were talking about mentorship programs. I, as I mentioned, I was involved in a lot uh, relating to that. And so uh, we thought to ourselves, let's build a tech-enabled mentorship program. Um, and then we started hitting problems. Uh, scalability, uh, how do you make mentors, uh, you know, uh, ensure that they're going to always be there, uh, quality, are you interested in mixing, um, you know, uh, adults with minors? So, so like, there's all these different things that come up. And so... That's when our team collectively came together and thought to ourselves, you know, people are saying they want a better mentorship program. Is that what they really want? And so inspiration from Henry Ford back in the day when people back then were telling um, the people there uh, back then was, we want a faster horse. And what did Henry Ford do? He made the car. And so we ourselves thought to ourselves, like, do we really, we're hearing mentorship program, but uh is that what really the audience is really asking for? And that led us to our first pivot. And so it literally is just having, a, again, trying your trying your hardest, really. Uh, but then also acknowledging when maybe the, the best thing to do is, again, not quit, but to remember to take maybe, maybe you're looking, you have tunnel vision, take a step back, look at a 10,000 foot view. Are you looking at the whole picture? Uh, I will say that's something that um, I, I am, you know, you're, you're getting better at because sometimes I'll get, as a founder, you get so focused on one thing. And if you're really trying to build a holistic solution, you have to sometimes remember, Hey, how is this one piece of our little whole thing? And so, um, when you realize that one piece isn't kind of matching everything else, that's again, at least that's one indication for myself that I've learned over time to maybe we're not looking at this right. Exactly. So another thing too, um, if you can't have like a personal board of advisors, right? You know, of course, there's a board of advisors coming, but have a personal board of advisors. Not people go say yes is the greatest thing ever, but like people go like actually give you honest feedback and hey guy or girl, you you you, you dacked this up right. You need you need that feedback. Um, so I'm gonna talk about myself real fast. I haven't done it yet. So my name is Jason Cabinet, retired army officer. I have an HR tech company. Uh, we um, automate HR product services by using AI bots, but also product access to a dedicated HR business partner. Just sort of crawl fun. Also do a podcast called the Jason Kevin Experience. Everyone here has been on a podcast and be here, here like next month, I think, you know. So I've interested people on that. Um quite follow up to you. I mean if you want to more like to Amy, anything else you want to add or talk about before you turn over to the students for their questions? Um, just reach out. Reach out to your network, reach out to me, contact. Contact us. This is my co. I don't feel like I introduced my co-founder. This is we met. Um, having someone in your corner really, really strongly, I feel like I've been able to get so far because we we've been doing this together for a long run. It's hard to be a solo founder, and so just having that support, it's been really, really great. Um, and don't 
be afraid of, we can't, we have a lot of conflict, but balance managing conflict is important because that diversity of opinion is really, really important. Like to be outside of your own head. But if you can take your difference of perspective and then work like together to create something that's better than the both of you, and that's why we're so successful. That's a good point, Amy, because I'm like, you know, you know who you are, right? Like me, I'm a intro, I'm an NFT introvert, right? I'm not creative. So how am I going to look bring on a co-founder as an introvert too, right? That's saying you're going to work, right? So you got to have someone to balance yourself. All right, Byron? Anything oh. you want to add or anything? <laughs> what do y'all want to know? I mean, I can talk for days, I don't know if you're going to be interested in it. Is there any, y'all don't care about the track stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> What's up? Uh, just want to know how you got into commercial real estate at the beginning, if you were. Oh, since just, or were you investing? Or? No, no. So uh, I'm a finance guy. So we're the bankers. So I'll, I mean, to be honest with you, after I did all the reading on like how it actually works, I literally started athletes. So in my training group, um, I can't take the person's name, but it was, it was a professional athlete. Um, and I reached out to not all, but it's the, the banking culture in Texas is different. I started in Texas. Uh, it's different than it is out here, pretty much everywhere, because there's so many banks and credit unions there, which is a good thing. So I reached out to maybe 70 of them, uh, between banks and credit unions in Texas, found out their, uh, like their lending criteria, what they were looking for, and they just started with my training group, uh, in Texas. So that was the first deal, uh, made, that was the most money I've made in one, like, go at it. And then from there, I just hit the networking groups hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was shaking every hand that I could um, and just got started that way, to be honest with you. And then, I mean, once you get started with stuff, you, you have an idea of where you want to take it. But once you get started, it's like a snowball effect as far as like your network, because then that that person know that person and then they know you as, you know, the person that do this. And then the leads just kind of start automating, uh, automatically just coming in from there. Um, so that that's how I got started. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. So anything else you want to add before we turn off the question? Uh, I want to know, like, what else are you, I, uh, what are they, well, what are you, yeah. Yeah, we're well, just so open for questions now, so, so just ask any questions y'all want. Yeah. It's the best part, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't be shy. No, okay. um, so, I, you guys are, like, all CEOs. Do you like the benefits you get more from being in a position, or do you like the position of helping? So I answer that fast. So, so a lot of people that started coming in, because, like, man, I hate working for my boss. I'm going to be my own boss. Right. Like, your pet is your boss. Your employee is your boss. <laughs> so being a CEO isn't about being a boss, right? It's about serving others and, and solving problems, right? Mm -hmm. We might answer that. So anyone have to go to add on. It's awesome. You're really passionate about it? Yeah. Well, it's it, it's awesome. I mean, people treat you differently. They just do. It, that's a fact. They just do. Um, but to expand on what Jason said, I mean, being the boss doesn't mean, let me tell you what it's not. Being a, like uh, authoritarian, Kind of just, you do that because I said so. It's not, it's really not that. What you have to do is be incredibly diplomatic. You have to convince your executive teams. Uh, for me, uh, my executive team, my bankers, my clients, uh, the vendors that we work with. So like the, the, the private equity firms or the hedge funds, like that's really what I, I have to constantly be convincing people that they should be doing whatever it is I want them to do. But listen. No one's going to say, it. I'm going to be honest with you. It is awesome. Like I was at the car dealership the other day. Guy asked me what I did. Told him he treated me differently. It's lit. I mean, <laughs> it just is. Yeah. But I mean, if you look at what the reality of what the job actually is and what you actually have to do, I mean, if you're in it to get the recognition, you're going to quit because it's, it's just like running track. Yeah. If you're in it to make the Olympic team, just so you can take that picture, you're going to quit because the work it takes to get there is so much more than actually being at the Olympics. It's not even close. It's so far apart. It was shot. Yeah. Um, so I hope that answered your question. Yeah. 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 If you see how you, you, you have problems, so you got to solve everyone's problem, your boy's problem, your customer problems, <laughs> and it's your neighbor's problem, the guy giving you coffee problems, you get solving problems all day long. So do you want us to add on that? I, I completely agree um, with that. Uh, I, if it's part of the title you guys are going to go after, uh, I was once a COO for another organization. But, and then that's when it clicked to me. Like, why am I not doing my own thing? And, it, you know, I think once you see the operations on how the business actually runs, it's a lot of work. And it's also a lot of stuff you're not going to want to do. It's, it's, you know, there's there's the day-to-day -day, um, stuff. And, uh, but at the end of the day, it's either you're wanting the freedom because you do have, when you get a lot of time, 
You have to be able to time block, time manage your own time um, and really stick to it because you're not on someone else's schedule on someone telling you. It's kind of your own, but on your own, your, your account, you're holding yourself accountable to what you're wanting to get done or accomplish to the next thing. You're not waiting for someone to tell you like, hey, uh, I need this. No, it's you trying to get that client and it's you following up with that client and it's you closing that client and it's you providing customer service and asking what they are needing next. Like, what's next? Are you okay? Like, you need anything else? You're pretty much catering to the clients because that's the one that will make you want to do A, B, or C. And um, your scaling part, I think, when it comes down to it, um, I'm now in that scaling and growing mode where I am now, is that sometimes it's not a, a pretty sight. You have to, you have to really reflect on it. It's like, okay, so where is the deficit of finances? Like, where are we spending, you know, the, your I's and your T's and everything? Um, you know, the class that I teach at the university, I somewhat teach from the textbook, but I also teach from my experience because I, I tell my students in, at the university, I'm like, hey, you can teach all of this and all you want in the books, but at the end of the day, it's like, it's a trial and error. And if are you really willing to risk and take uh, X, Y, and Z to get to where you want to be in the next five years. Hey, Bob, question for you. How often should someone follow up? Some people say follow up two or three times. Some people say follow up until we get a no. How often should someone follow up? I don't have a hard number. I don't believe that kind of stuff. I mean, I just follow up. And to be honest with you, I have a lot going on. So like, if I follow up and I don't hear anything, I'm probably going to forget about it. Again, to be honest, I'm probably going to see them again. So, it's, you know, it, it's too... Uh, I think I think uh, when you haven't done business, like you're trying to be too tactical about it, and it's, you're not like you're trying to do the cheap and not really just do the natural way of shaking a hand, kissing baby, and like kind of build it that way. Because I mean, if you're doing that and you follow up, we're going to respond anyway. By the way, um, people are busy. I mean, especially as you get higher in business, like busy people understand busy people. You don't even you wouldn't even remember that they didn't even hit you back. It's just you got too much stuff going. That didn't answer the question. Someone else had a question? Yeah. I'm sure they ended up fine, but how do y'all manage passion projects with business? They do, they do intertwine for me. Yeah. They do intertwine. So well, my exact strategy is to leverage, because I, I work directly with board CEOs, founders, et cetera, um, or like chief investment officers. So um, I just leverage that into to my passion projects. So the way I approach it is you know, be, because of, there's, there's off balance sheet, um, uh, there's an off balance sheet asset to, to have an investment made because it's hard to quantify relationships. Now, it's not a hard asset. You can't point to it, but it's there. Um, I guess it would be kind of under equity, but I, I, don't, I don't know. It's hard to. Um, so what I do is just call in favors. <laughs> hey, Fred, I'm doing this thing. I did that thing for you. Hire the kids. Can you help me out here? Of course, Byron. You're the coolest guy I know. <laughs> but it is a lot like that, though. Yeah. Anyone else want to add on that? I do it based on if I can assemble a team behind it and if I can get traction. If there's other people who are interested in the idea and they want to hop on board and work with me, then like I'm going for it. If it's just me out there by myself and it's my like I almost do that by my there's I'm not as interested in that. I'm very into team dynamics and creating things for people. So that's how I, I intertwine my passion projects. More people that I want to hop on and it's like, oh wow, everybody is doing the work that they love doing. I want to provide them those resources. Let's go. All right. Hey, before we say one question, I want to do this right. I'm gonna have each one of you like, you know, tell us you're working on that. We're like, if, if you're working on something, we can help you out. We just know we're gonna help you out, right? So who goes you first? Um, are, are you like either you're, you're, you're either you're working on a company, you can think about working on a company, or what's your ideal? Maybe. I'm interested in the candidate for the You're what's in the right state. Yeah, yeah, I have a lot of people. Yeah, it's the state to be in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I have right. a lot of investment partners that are actually looking to put more capital in the candidate space. So. Is it is it legal in Louisiana? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. All right. Next, please. I'm interested in your fitness industry currently. I do a teach group fitness talk with other studio drivers. So I'd be interested in doing up a similar studio like that. You like trying to do like a franchise model or like any type of fitness model, something like that, or more like a small boutique fitness studio, like. A more professional, like, business vibe, I guess. Okay. All right. Thank you.
quick question before you go to yeah. the next one. Uh, would you teach that also um, online? Would you make yes, it? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Next, please. I'm Layla. I'm an information systems major, so I'm more on the supporting, like y'all said, not really starting, but just seeing like what I might want to look for in a, com a smaller company and how I could support them. Yeah, you're the person you talked about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm JC. I'm an information systems major as well. Um, as far as what type of business I would want to start, probably something where I could automate processes using AI um, software and the tech side is most interesting to me. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my name is Clinton. I go by Q. I uh, want to start um, ideally uh, in a chemical production company, uh, similar to that of your Universal Warner. Um, I want to stay on the smaller, more independent side, but something that creates quality uh, materials. Uh, for, for okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jeremy. Uh, I'm a YouTuber. So my kind of like passion is to create content. Uh, I think my biggest challenge right now is finding what content I actually feel passionate about kind of pursuing and what niche I can like fulfill. So do you uh, want to like overtake Mr. Beast? No, he's like sick. I've been that that was my issue for a long time. I was trying to be someone that I wasn't. I've been doing YouTube for like two years. Uh, and I have a friend that I do it with, but that's why I think now the biggest hurdle is aligning my passion of like filmmaking with something that I can actually see myself like personally, personally doing. You are very, you, you are very far ahead of mm -hmm. so many people because you realize that you weren't trying to be someone else anymore. And it, it took me two years to figure that out. It's it's probably it, longer, yeah. Yeah. Good, I think, good for you. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you. And you got a question? Jeremy is a story to tell you. Okay. Yeah, right. he, 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 likes to, he likes to do this. Uh, well, part of my like Mr. Beast, I guess, Mr. Beastification, uh, I was just trying to do the craziest ideas possible. So, uh, over the summer, I went to LA, uh, and I was just kind of thinking of what title do people want to click on the most? Um, so I saw a skydiving place and I got in contact with them. And I also found like a ghost pepper stand. Um, so I've never been skydiving. I had a ghost pepper like once in my life. So, uh, I got the place, uh, to be okay with me to get a ghost pepper and then jump out of the airplane. So that was like one of my first like kind of crazy <laughs> ideas. Uh, then I went on to go like bull riding. Um, I did like a fear factor type video where I was like submerged in a tank of like maggots. Um, yeah, just I'm interested in talking to you in five years because I think you clearly got stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask, I was like, why not continue doing what you're doing? <laughs> well, so I, I really do enjoy those like topics and um, I like the stories that it makes. It's just we invested a lot of money, time, yeah. uh, my sanity uh, yeah, into the ideas and in return, you get like maybe a thousand views. Uh, our shorts do a lot better, obviously, because people look at it fans. You're looking at it wrong. Because um, remember we talked earlier about the DoorDash and stuff. Yeah. You, so you, what you did was you, you tried something, you put a product out, you learn so much that you can now leverage into the next thing yeah. that you do. Mm -hmm. um, so we were talking earlier before you guys got here that, you know, there's so many people in your age bracket that like they're DoorDash and Uber and Amazon, et cetera, right now. They're looking at it, they think they're losers because they're on Instagram, looking at other people who are actually worse off than they are right there. Um, over leverage, bad credit, you know, living with their parents. Mm -hmm. You know, they're comparing themselves to people who are just putting out their, their best their best shit, right? Yeah. You know, and if if you're the one that's grinding or doing something slash, you know, putting out a product, you're learning a lot of actual like skills that you just don't value right now because you're too early in the process to actually value it the right way. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't look at, I don't even care about the dollar amount, to be honest with you. Yeah. Hey, listen, I'm gonna tell you a secret. You're not gonna make a lot of money in the next few years. Yeah. Get out of here, mm -hmm. it's not happening. Let's assume that you're top of your class, whatever degree, you know, best job, it's still not gonna be a lot of money. So mm -hmm. forget about the money part. Um, what you're doing right now is worth so much more money than you can probably even conceive right now. You have to look at it 10, 20 years from now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep creating content. I think uh, just do it for yourself, right? I, mm -hmm. I don't think not for the views because there's a tangible part of that, but you're not tying your worth or yourself to those views uh, because you yourself may be, you know, providing value to whoever yeah. finds your, your stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And I think like even with that, uh, I think it's hard not to start something and picture like all the fame or status that comes along with it. Yeah. Uh, but I think now, like even with a few like shorts, there's something that I've gotten like millions of views, 
that's such a like a fleeting feeling like it's there's no substance behind it so like i think now that we've gone through that journey and like you said developed those skills we understand that, that there's a lot more to it than just like kind of the numbers or the fame or the money and that question is honestly like, harder to answer yeah. the skills are worth so much more even if you got a million views the mm -hmm. skills you learn from it is it, it hope it's, it's worth his weight and go. It, it's worth so much more than the views. Yeah. People will forget the views. Yeah. They'll watch the video on the next. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so gratification is not good. Yeah. Another good skill for y'all to get, like, it is hard for people to do this, like, you just getting your camera and, like, telling your story to the camera, right? And, and posting yeah. on different places, right? That's a good skill to have. But mm -hmm. you're next. Year. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm kind of all over the place in what I want to do. Yeah. I, I'm considering getting my JD MBA. But an end goal for me would be having my own um, nonprofit for rehabilitating homeless people. Mm -hmm. um, that's nice. like my main interest. And I feel like it's not really talked about, like starting your own nonprofit. It's just in the business world, it's not, it's not really a thing. Like so, just starting. And my business model involves owning real estate and like having that as a startup, like brick and mortar. When most of the people we've been talking about is like tech startups, and you don't need as much like overhead and stuff like that. So stuff like that I'd be interested in. Right, thank you. Hi, I'm Olivia and I currently interned at a commercial real estate brokerage. So that's kind of the path I want to go down. So you don't probably saw this guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I was so lucky. <laughs> I'm Clay, I'm an information systems major. So I'm going into um, consulting actually, cyber risk consulting. So maybe I think Later on, I'd be interested in, you know, going smaller, start my own business or something. Really, anything with technology interests me, but cybersecurity has kind of been my focus. Yeah, cybersecurity is a hot thing right now. Uh, my name is Ryan. Uh, I have an HVAC consulting business and an HVAC business. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's real business. <laughs> but it will always be in need. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, it'll be you. Next. Hi, I'm Stanley. So, uh, I'm, so my path is trying to create, uh, e-commerce store, like around, like maybe selling like products from China and bring it to America. So uh, I think I can introduce you. I met a friend of mine, John Neff. He, uh, I, I used to make sure I had, he had like a e-commerce business in China, import stuff from China. So I'll introduce you to him. You have Twitter? Twitter, yes, sir. You should, uh, I'm 28, you know, I'm um, <laughs> you should, you should follow, you should follow, uh, two accounts. One's called Colty Bruh. I know it sounds weird, bro. It's Colty Bruh. And the other one is St. DC. These two dudes, they own, um, Kill Crew. That, um, you familiar with it? Uh, no, sir. They, they, they sell, um, a pair of what he fighters. Oh, um, they laid out their entire playbook on how to run an eight floor store. Like from, from day zero. I mean, you, if you do so much so that I wish I could stop my company to do that because like the playbook is there. And so follow those two accounts and just keep the information. You know? If you put it into, into action, you'll, you can start after that. What's it called? It's, 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 it's Colty, C O L T Y, C -O -L -T -Y I think underscore B R A H. Um, and then his business partner named, uh, his, his Twitter name is, is Saint. Underscore D C D I P I, I believe. It's a good part of our environment. All right, thank you. Most successful startup founders, they put all this stuff out in public, right? From zero to ten, they put everything out there so other people can copy it. All right. You know why? Because because the value is not in the actual idea, than the execution. Yeah. yeah. You give a damn about the idea. I I, I talked to uh, like a lot of startups, and they'll be like, uh, uh, you know, we want the money, but sign this NDA for the like, right here. Like, because it's not in the. I don't care what. I don't care. I, mean, I don't have the time to even, yeah. You can have the <laughs> ideas be nothing. You just have, it's all in execution. You're not executing. Yeah, I'm seconding that because of the event that we did prior to COVID, we saw so many uh, organizations trying to do what we did, but uh, did not emulate as much of success as my organization did because of the fact like execution is everything. You can have it your idea, but it's the execution and how you make it happen yeah all right next please i'm elijah i'm a filmmaker i'm an entrepreneurship major um i wanted to make films because i think there's a lot of opportunity in the industry for change 
I think that we're not making movies the same way that we were in the 90s back when um, the people that are really into art cinema and art house film, but also the moviegoers and the popcorn lovers, there's a chasm today where they're totally separated and they're not enjoying the same things, which is why they don't see the movies they are enjoying in the Oscars. I want to I want to bridge that divide. But simultaneously, while I make films and I started my freelancing videography company uh, where I tell people stories, I care about being a storyteller and I see the story in everybody. Uh, about two and a half years ago, my best friend passed away from cancer and he was into music. So he was a music guy, I was a film guy. And it totally changed the trajectory of my life because I was a freshman and I was just starting with my entrepreneurship degree. Everything was different about my, my disciplines and how I lived my life. And because of that moment, it was September 10th of this year, we three years, I started writing an album. And so for two and a half years, I've written an album. So I'm a filmmaker who has an album just sitting on the table, written. I'm recording it this summer and I'm releasing it September 10th. And uh, juggling that is definitely interesting, but trying to figure out how to make something of those two things that are seemingly different has been a struggle. And it's something, honestly, I'm interested to to continue. But yeah, this summer's going to be busy. <laughs> good for you. Talk to you, too. For sure, we've been talking. Exactly. <laughs> um, I'm Richie uh, from New Orleans. Um, I just got my real estate license and plan to go ahead with a residential or general contracting company. Uh, start that and, and uh, eventually go ahead and start my own projects on the side, you know, uh, invest in houses and apartments and all that. Yeah. Do you control construction? Uh, yeah, I've worked with my dad mostly. He, he kind of did a it was just him doing the labor, maybe one helper. Yeah. Kind of small. He retired a few years ago, but um, with all the learning that we've been doing, I could, I see how that can be scaled much larger. I have about 10 years of experience doing that since I was like 12 with them. So, yeah. so I, I love them. I didn't say a lot. So I actually own a, a, a parent uh, investment firm. So that, mm -hmm. that houses my investment bank and I own some real estate and a construction company. So find me after this because okay. I can help you with that. Yeah. Because um, construction businesses, okay. yeah, it, you have to roll up your sleeves. It's, it's real work. Yes. Yeah. So I'll talk to you. Okay. If you're looking for people in the labor union, I, I, the person here, my business partner's wife is the political director of Teams. So all of the unions. Awesome. Oh wow. That's a nice connection. I have a big one. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Joseph Lawrence. Um, I have been in sales in America for the past five and a half, six years, uh, and I've loved every minute of it, but I'm kind of ready to do my own thing. So I'm looking into a few different things right now, looking into the agency model, um, kind of just running a business and selling and you know, providing a, a service. Um, how scalable is that? I don't know, because, you know, it has a lot to do with your personality, um, the work that you put out. Um, but I'm kind of exploring. All week, I've kind of had open ears, bouncing different ideas inside, but any advice is welcome. You may be the uh, most well-positioned person out of all of y'all right now, because sales is so important. Like, it's just so important. It's the lifeblood of any business. Uh, I'm excited for you, to be honest with you. You're figuring out your business part, but you have like that, that groundwork pretty much do anything, in my opinion. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> in my opinion, I think you can pretty much do anything. You can, as long as you can sell some shit, I mean, mm -hmm. you pick the industry, you write your own checks. From what I feel. I'm Hayden Vadrine. Um, I'm going into my sophomore year at LSU. I own a streetwear clothing company with a few of my friends back at home. Um, also, and I want to do two other things. Uh, one more in the near future, I want to make a new social media app. That's what like I'm kind of working on the backbone stuff right now. Um, and then later on, after that, I kind of always use that as a stepping stone into making like a fast food company that's like healthy, that can kind of like just go around the nation and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's like the three things that like I want to work on at least right now. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Hey, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So I'll put everyone on the spot now. So if you ever ask, ask a question, I need you to ask a question. It can be any kind of question, be like, what's weather like, something serious, but I want everyone to ask at least one question if you haven't asked a question already. So I'm curious, you were talking about the difference between execution and idea, but how, how, what's the threshold of how much you sacrifice for the preparation of that execution? And I'm, I'm questioning whether or not I even understood your point of some, everybody can have an idea, but the execution is the most important. Uh, 
roll up your sleeves and make it happen kind of thing. But I think when you when you're executing, so say you're wanting to release your album, right? The album. So you would need to either distribute it yourself or you'll go to a distribution company or or the the records, right? The records uh, label such as Capital or there's independent labels that are here in Washington State or maybe in your state where you're wanting to do that. So in order for you, maybe you can release it on your digital platform or you can release it like on a CD in itself. So you'll have to either call, make your calls or where you want to distribute them or how you're going to distribute it or have people listen to the music that you're writing um, for people to hear it. So in that execution for even, you know, that's the end result is here, having people hear your music, but you reverse engineer it. It's like, how are you making it there? Like from point A to point B. You know, so that, that that distance, so to, to, to give you a visual, the distance between ideation and execution, who's the better artist? Mary J. Blige or your homegirl who can probably sing better than her but never put out an album? Mm-hmm. One executed, actually, you know, put the product out. The other one just talk shit. Just say, you know, just brag about yourself and actually do it. Following up on that, which is, so I kind of see entertainment, content creation, and all that stuff kind of as a very high tone of industry. So how would you consider um, operating in an industry where so much saturation, people are just people who are the next things? How, how would you consider I think what the last thing? Yeah, I can say what I do personally. I'm, there's no right or wrong answer to this in uh, my opinion, but I prefer the model of selling the shovels instead of trying to dig for gold, which is why I don't have a startup. <laughs> I finance startups. So that's how I mitigate that risk. I, I play the market. I don't try to be a participant in the market. Um, but again, broader. that's my approach, though. Okay, let me look broader and employ musicians to, to make find that goal instead of be trying to find myself. Is that what you're trying to say? Or are you saying if I were you, I'm not. <laughs> I want to be clear. But if I was, I would focus on building, like you said, the next universal. So like, find the artist and not try to be an artist. Yeah. In my opinion, and no, actually, I'm taking a step further. I, <laughs> if I were you, I would I would focus on finding the next QC or the next Cash Money. Because they're owned by a larger label. Yeah. So I would do that because they actually find the artists. You know, so in my world, that's like finding the fund. It's, it's like a fund to fund model. It's like trying to find the funds to put the money into yeah. for model funds. Yeah. yeah, it's just so kind of competitive. I was thinking more so um, with the stream of independent talent, kind of finding a way to put them in competitive opportunities instead of competing with these huge guys yeah, like Universal been around for 20 years to control all the news outlets, all the film and TV. So instead of competing with them, Find a way to capitalize off of the independent market in such a surplus right now. You yeah. couldn't compete with them right now, even yeah. if you wanted to. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, there's a label called Selection there in LA. He started 10 years ago, but he's finding these undergrad, uh, underdog, uh, artists yeah. like you off the of SoundCloud. I found him on SoundCloud and I've, fo- I've been following him. He's now there. It's been 10 years, but they've definitely branched out from the entertainment spot and the events, right. um, as well as merch, merchandise right. and the royalties. He has a show on uh, Apple Music with Beats One. So, I, I mean, I'll send that to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I just so, want to redefine what it means to be successful in the industry. I feel like you don't have to be a superstar to, you know, to make no. a living off of Beats One. You define no, no, no. what success is to you. Yeah. 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 And, and, yes. If I were to add on that, I think I'd really focus, personally, uh, what's, what's the message you're really trying to give across? Because you'll find out, again, people, again, will, like, they are, you know, different, but the same thing, you'll find, find out those who also really relate to that, that message. Yeah. And you might know, like, oh, uh, you start realizing a group feel people relate to the message, but what specifically they love about it. And the next thing you know is like actually very conceptual. It's like, oh, they love this because of this particular reason and expand from that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Authenticity is important. Knowing who your target audience is, knowing what your market is, knowing what your positioning is. And the tools of production have come to the masses now. Uh, I love artists like Toby Mukwe. He like made it to the Grammys recently. He like hustle. I love a hustler. And he didn't sign with any label. He does every like he would do twisted Sundays and he would put a rap out every single Sunday. He's like, this is what I'm doing. And he now he's in like the latest Transformers movie. So you can work your way up, especially with the technology that's available now. All right, who hasn't asked a question yet? Byron, why did you come to Seattle from Texas? 
Oh my! Thank you. you know, I um I work all over, so I'm not just in Seattle. But I I like I live here primarily now because my parents moved here. Um, they moved from Virginia to to uh, to here, and I, I'm I'm really close to my parents. Mm-hmm. I'm a very tight knit family, so I came out here so I can see them every week, essentially. Because when I was in school in Texas, I never got a song, mm-hmm. uh, so I wanted to make sure like if I had the means, I'd be able to see them as much as I can. Right. So do you fly around a lot, or do you do a lot of work online? Oh, I'll be both. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I mean, I have to be in Houston uh, maybe this weekend. I, listen, I'll take any excuse to go to Houston, but mm-hmm. I just have to have fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, I, I, have to, I have to travel a lot. Mm-hmm. I'm all over the place. What part of Virginia? Richmond. Ashburn. Ashburn? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I was born in Richmond, but I graduated in 757. Okay. I went to uh, yeah, West, uh, Virginia Beach area. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Any questions on this side? Uh, yeah. Um, Eddie, I'm going to go work for a big consulting firm as well. Um, I was wondering how you knew it was time to like pivot into the startup space and what lessons you learned from consulting helped you from your startup venture. I think it's going to, my answer to that's been very different, probably from a very traditional, uh, someone who wanted to go to on that consulting. So quite frankly, I didn't even know about consulting with a thing. I just, uh, just did some very great quality work for companies I worked for, and the employees remembered me when they left and said, hey, have you considered management consulting? I was like, oh, what's that? <laughs> and so I just kind of wandered into the space um, because, one, is I, I'm a learner. Uh, so uh, being in a position to go have the opportunity to work with some of the immensely smart people uh, was something that really uh, nice to me. So like my supervisor was graduated from Stanford and went to an M7 school and his director was from Oxford. And I'm like thinking myself, I just came from like you know, this off target school that somehow ended up here kind of. And so for me, I was really looking at it in terms of it really fit what I wanted to do in the future, which was in this place, I wanted to know what made successful companies work. And so in this particular opportunity, um, our clients were private equity. And so they would have our teams get deployed to do due diligence, um, operational due diligence, and identify red, yellow, and green flag opportunities for you know synergies or whatnot. And so for me, every single time I went on site, um, I think I probably did close to 30 M&A deals where it was this a learning opportunity. Like, well, what made these companies work and great, and people wanted to uh, to continue seeing them go great. And so that's what. Um, really showcased to me. Um, and then at some point, I just, uh, I began kind of ideating a future gen while I was again um, working at the management consultant. And at some point in time, it kind of just, my priorities just kind of switched. I realized that uh, not working on future gen was no longer secondary. And I was just, every single time I was off work, I was like, oh, I'm going to work on this right away. And I remember there was a point in time when I was traveling across the country where as soon as I was off of my assignment, I would literally go to the colleges and freak so many college students out, like, so what do you want to do in the future? Um, and, you know, I then just start getting to know the audience. So at some point, it just, it just felt right. Like, I didn't want to do anything else. Thank you. Yes. Um, kind of adding to that, um, I'm going to, like, a larger consulting company as well this summer. And I'm just wondering, as somebody who doesn't really want to start their own business, but work maybe looking to work for a smaller business, what do you think are some of the benefits of working for a smaller business versus a large corporate firm? Yeah, so, you know, I had an opportunity to work in Johnson & Johnson and then Hyundai. Those are my two big companies I worked for. Uh, I was at work for work for, I also interned, like at Morgan Stanley, um, some of the things like that. But I would say for, Myself, what I learned is in terms of a bigger corporation is that if you're participating or an employee there, you're actually part of a machine. And so you have a role. And so when you become a subject matter expert in something in that machine, you become so immensely valuable. Um, they'll, they'll, they won't want to get rid of you. I remember when I told Hyundai that I was going to pursue management consulting, they literally said, Eddie, what do we have to do to keep you here? They gave me two counter offers to keep me there. And the only reason why I left is because I told myself if they did not meet the, not expectations, but they didn't hit the, the deadline that I gave myself that I told them, then I just, that was going to be my sign. And so, uh, so for a bigger organization, it definitely more of a, you have a specific role, 
understand it. But I would say the greatest opportunity to grow in legal or larger organizations is just don't pigeon yourself there. Be very curious on like how everything works because ultimately uh, if you become a problem solver, you're dangerous wherever you go. And so when I went to a much smaller uh, boutique management uh, consulting firm, it was more uh, hands on deck. You just you apply every single lesson that you can learn. You open the door for and um, and so it was just very different environment. Uh, you you were doing you're in the trenches with your your uh, with your managers. Your managers are working alongside. It's a completely different vibe entirely. And it's I would say having a out reflection myself if I were to go back into either one of those roles. I think I would love to be a problem solver for our company. Uh, I, I just love, you know, I was nicknamed a Han Solo uh, at Hyundai because I would just kind of just navigate and people like him when he's around, he's a problem solver and he's kind of not off chain, but <laughs> um, he just, he just means business and just going to figure it out. Um, Han Solo is also one of my favorite Star Wars characters. So I, I was, but anyways, that's, that's my exercise there. And is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want us to talk to about the students? Anything we haven't covered yet? I think so. I mean, not a good coverage. Yeah, I didn't ask anything personal though. It's been like kind of <laughs> <laughs> what events did you run? What events? Yeah, four hundred hurdles. Uh, professionally, yeah. but in, in college, I mean, everything from the one up to the eight hundred. Because I mean, you have to when you run four hurdles. You kind of got to be good at everything, or at least good enough. I was curious though, uh, Q shared this uh, dream and vision, but uh, when he gets home, he's going to start working in Nestle at Nestle. So it's like I'm, I'm, I'm making it sound like I go to work for Nestle. I right? dream for Christ. But there's a lot. <laughs> can you sort of give the uh, perspective like there's a lot you can learn? Like, I don't know, the reason. I didn't have any clue how much I learned. My, my first job was at a General Motors factory, yep. manufacturing engineer. And I, for a year and a half, I said, this job sucks. I'm going to grab it. Yep. But I had to do it. I mean, I had pride enough to get up every morning, go in early, work double shifts, and learn as much as I could. But I didn't know what I learned until like 10 years later. Yeah. And I still tell stories about it that I'm um, about working with union workers and against managers at UWA at that time and in place. So it's, it's, it's interesting. But you got a lot you can learn at Netflix. And okay, can you guys speak to any? What role are you going to be doing? Uh, so it's a sales position. And that's like, here's something. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. 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 I, I, I hope, man. Yeah. Yeah. All you can, I, I, all, I think all of us are dreaming. If you can do sales, do some kind of sales business. Yeah, that's what I think. It's, um, of course, it's not like my passion, but it, it pays the bills and it is something that will build my skill set, um, at least networking and put me in a new city. Um, yeah, so it's constipated selling. Um, and it's something that's, a, a back product, I mean, Hershey's been around for hundreds of years. Uh, it's been around for hundreds of years, so I can probably sell that easily. Um, so, yes. Hey, let me tell you something. You better make it your passion. I'm going to tell you why. It's not even about the product, because you're going to be talking to people. You're selling yourself right now. Um, that's what sales is, connecting with people, understanding understanding them, finding out their story, and seeing if there's a way you can come in and kind of solve their problem if they have one, or just being a friend and, and keeping it from afar. All that sell. Yeah. So you're getting that for free. So much so, I know the pain that you should be paying them for the opportunity. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm dead serious. Like, that's how valuable it is. You, The skills you learn there will transfer to any industry at, at any level, including C-level. Um, it, it's just how, it just depends on how you look at it. Right. Now, if you're going into it like, I'm not driving a Benz, you know, yeah. you set yourself up for failure. But if you go in there with the mission, you won't be the guy who drives the Benz if you play your cards right. You'd be the guy who who's riding the G7. Like, that's, I promise you. Yeah. Like, just go into it with an open mind and, and be resourceful and understand what the game plan is. It's not to make friends. All right. Well, I guess literally it is, but, you know, it's it, it's, it's not kind of the fuck off. You, you, you're there to learn a skill so you can take it to the music industry. Right. Yeah. Don't forget that. And one thing I forgot to add in music fast public speaking. Yeah. If you're not, no one likes public speaking, no one's comfortable with it, but you got to get in front of people and convince them to do what you want them to do right. It's, it's another city to have. It's I, I, I would say right behind the tail, like get in front of people, complete strangers, and just share your story, convince them to do what you want them to do. That's so important. It is selling though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can't do more without other. I had a shadow partner. I uh, interned um, during the semester before I picked the position. And it was cool because I had him, but like once I started working alone, it's definitely a different 
you know, going by yourself and kind of approaching these people that don't really know you and kind of proving your credibility and then getting them to understand. You know, let me let me tell you something real quick. All right, and let you go. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. When from from 19 to 23, no one knows the ball. They know now on Instagram. <laughs> Those four years, while I was running track, you know, the guy, right? I had a, I, I met a guy who owns a middle market, a lower middle market company. Well, I guess mid middle market now, but they sell the emergency lights to police cars and, and fire, uh, fire trucks. Yeah. Um, he does really well. Um, I met him. I sold my stuff. I, I told him what I did. He happened to have a passion for track. So I offered to, he's not American. So, um, I offered to train with him and in return, I'll be able to shadow him at the job for free. Um, I did that for four years. And what I learned there is literally invaluable. I mean, literally the things I learned there for free, I took and started an investment bank, literally, like literally. So I say that to tell you that, and I wasn't paid for that either. And that was after hard training days. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and just assume you can't run the 400 hurdles at Olympic level. No. All right. <laughs> just know, <laughs> It was long days, all right? And I still did that for four years before and after training um, because it was worth it. Yeah. I mean, the way I looked at it, it was a fair trade-off. I didn't have access to people who had that knowledge or that success. He was the most successful person I knew at the time. I'll do anything, even to be around him, even to know what you ate at night. I'll do anything. <laughs> that's, but that's, you kind of have to do stuff like that. Yeah. But you have a good opportunity because you get paid to do this. So one last thing about public speaking for turnover, when you like to speak in front of people, like a group of people, the audience, the audience can presume you're the subject matter expert, right? The, you're, you're from, you're gonna assume that you know what you're talking about automatically before you even open your mouth up. Um, in sales, so you're gonna be traveling a lot. Uh, meet as many people as you can because you never know who knows someone, who knows someone, um, because, uh, yeah, you just never know. You guys all start with the adventure college or you work for For me? I, uh, I have, always been working uh, either on weekends or I would always have hustles, like side hustles. I had had my main opportunity, but I would always go to events and meet people just so I can meet people. And cause you just never know. I always, I'm very passionate about um, connecting people where like, if there's an opportunity, I'm like, okay, Hey, here's this, like, here's this people, here's this, this is, this is the person I think you should meet because this is that like, a lot of people are like, why don't you sell your Rolodex? I'm like, no. What, what happens now is that it's social capital is what's happening now. It's what um, yeah. Yeah. has become a big thing is uh, social capital. Um, a lot of my jobs that I have gotten up to now or before I started my own organization has always been some by someone I know. Um, I've only done one job interview. Everything else has been through people I've known or just by being at the right place at the right time and um, having opportunity given to me right there. Um, but I, I don't get me wrong, it's like, I, I wanted to go into, like I wanted to meet CP, C-suite people. I'm like, what are these people doing? You know, you gotta pretend sometimes. I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's not, it's kind of nerve wracking. You know, I would get nervous, but I think um, like, hey, if you need a volunteer at this place, like, you know, I'll be there, like, just so you can rub elbows with these people and, you know, really talk to these people and really get to know them because you just never know who they know. And, um, yeah, I met a few of Laker people, uh, just because of that. And there's a production company where I, I'm pretty sure you guys know his name. He does a lot of the Batman movies. And I met him. I didn't know who he was. I was just really having a conversation and I ended up connecting with him in a deeper level where he was like, oh, if you're ever in Santa Monica area or LA area, here's my contact information. So, I mean, you just never know like, hey, it may not happen at this point, but later on, you just never know who you make. So. Um, I actually had a question for Byron. Um, I was wondering, balancing it all, like I obviously not at the same level as you, but I play lacrosse in Texas, like in a Texas league. Um, okay. So like we're on the road to, um, Tech, like did like UT Austin, Texas A&M all the time. And like, I'm trying to do well in school as well. Like, how did you balance that with having a business? Like sometimes there's things where you have to pick one or the other. Like, how do you, how do you know what to prioritize? Well, I didn't start a company until I was professional. Okay. So I didn't, but when I was in school, I was like, 
I was the guy that always had, always had an idea. It was, mm-hmm. I had a new startup. Yeah, you know, I was that guy. That's how, that's why I like took the extreme opposite and decided to sell the shovels instead. Um, but to be honest with you, you're not going to like it probably, but I'm not the balance guy. I'm mm-hmm. just not. I'm the extreme guy. I go all, I, I dump everything in it. I'm like, fuck it. I'm going to just figure it out. I'm going to jump off, teach my fucking block. That's, mm-hmm. that's me though. I'm not saying you should do that. I'm not saying you should do that. Yeah. But the benefit of doing that is that you're going to force yourself to learn something. Mm-hmm. Like you, is it a sink or swim? I mean, you don't want to die. You got to figure something out. That's why I'm really big on, on DoorDash, Uber Eats, um, Amazon, like all that kind of stuff. Because if you're going all in on something, it, sometimes it, it, that's required. You know, um, when I was in school, though, um, bless it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know the press is here. But. I wasn't the, the class guy. I, I, wasn't the, I would never show up to something like this, <laughs> to be honest with you. I, um, you, you kind of just got to know who you are, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I know it's kind of leaving you in a weird spot, but <laughs> I, I just don't, even to this day, I don't do well with balance. I, I get after it, man. I'm the hustle guy. I'm, I'm, I'm the hustle, hustle guy. I, I really get after it. I don't do balance. Yeah, the follow-up on Barbara said, mm-hmm. like, I mean, Elon Musk has a, lot of, has a lot of criticism, right? But like uh, the fact remains, like if you work something like hundred hours a week and somewhere else, like I'm working, he's working hundred hours a week, I'm working four hours a week. He's gonna be so far ahead of me, right? Even if you know he's like I'm trying to do it right, but sometimes you have to put in the hours sometimes, right? Yeah. I'm into balance. <laughs> I, I have a six-year-old daughter. I have a, a traditional career path. I'm not gonna give up my family just for my startup. I'm not gonna sacrifice. Anything. Um, and I think it can be done. I'm very into sustainable lifestyles. It's really important for me. I, I live and die by my calendar and I'm into like mentoring people. I'm into giving back to the community. I'm not going to put what I'm doing at the sacrifice of everything else. And so I am, everything is very, very planned. Um, my grad school programs part time. They're like, Hey, if you're putting too much into academics, you're doing it wrong. You should be here networking with other people. And so for me, I lean on my support network just a ton. Um, and so my husband's with my daughter, um, like people, I have a team that does like everybody submits to a group of time. It's very different than engineering. I feel like engineering, it's just like you're doing it alone and you're getting you really good at it with, um, the MBA. It's about, it's all teamwork focused, which is really, really great. And so because of that, I fall to my support network in order to get things done that I could do alone. But you forgot what it was best for you. Yeah. I'm you happy that we don't do the same thing because but you need to see that because now you don't, you dispel the notion that there's one way of doing something. Like yeah. If you're an entrepreneur, you should know that there's like a, a infinite way of doing something. Now you know. So, sorry though, I'm not down. <laughs> so, any other questions? Yes. Um, so, we didn't talk a lot about uh, like the metrics and kind of what Tara was saying earlier about business about having high levels of like, overhead that you go into that business, you have to spend a lot of money to get it started. How do you suggest? Managing that and also doing some of the being a score, like being a professional, I guess, for the shop if you're getting paid. But like maybe like having a family or having to be able to afford bills, like how do you manage, like how does such high investment cost and also flipping? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I've gotten probably $200,000 from student pitch competitions. I get grants through the university. I have probably $50,000 of students loan a, a year. Um, There's free money out there, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> my, I also have a husband who contributes to my family's household. Um, so I've managed to leverage the maximum amount of resources that I can. And then I also leverage the networks that I have as well by doing all of these various networking events. Um, We've um, found partnerships and people who can, maybe we can side skirt a lot of this uh, angel investing and traditional investing by just making a large partnership with an industrial manufacturer who's excited about our technology. And so there are non-traditional ways to do things. And if you put yourself out there and network, like people in my cohort were, are the, the president of engineering and robotics at, uh, at Airbus. So those all those connections that you meet, like when people say networking, it's hard to, but it's, it's those little things, those people having those connections. It's like, yes, I can. I can buy your technology and use it at my company. And so go find those people, take the time to do these events and get to talk. Did you mean that specifically for her? Uh, just if any of you, you know. I, I, mean, I know personally, the first thing I did was scale down my life. Um, I had to make a lot of unpopular decisions at, at 23. It wasn't fun, but I kind of just have to figure it out. To be honest with you, you have to kind of do what you got to do to get by. 
So I think the number one thing you should focus on, in my opinion, I don't know what I'm talking about, but is can you keep the lights on? Can you keep food on the table? And then from there, you kind of just got to figure it out. I didn't give up. I hate saying it, man. I was living life in Texas, too. I give up my, I had a nice apartment. I had to give up the uh, BMW I was driving. Uh, it, it just, it, that's what's like required to be an entrepreneur. Um, now these aren't big sacrifices looking at it retroactively, but at 23, it is <laughs> was more important than a BMW in a nice apartment, <laughs> you know, but you, you'll figure it out. You'll, you'll figure it out, especially if you're, if you're dead serious about whatever, you know, business or whatever direction you want to go. These are easy decisions. If you're really serious about it, be completely honest with you. Going off what Angie said, oh, sorry. Oh, if I, if I may. Oh yeah. My um, you know, something I would also include in that is that there's actually a lot more flexible opportunities around the way to make things happen than what we may think that it has to be done this one way. So, for example, um, you know, uh, our, our company, you know, we're not an HR company. We're not going to hire accounts in HR. Company. We're going to outsource that. And so, like, when I think about it, like, in your situation, uh, maybe there's a possibility for, uh, like, through your school, maybe there's a way for you to, like, Make a club, and by making a club, you can you know rent out a room, and in this room, you're able to uh, do like almost like a proof of concept idea, which is um, you know you can charge it up some like a, a membership fee, and in that membership fee, you're able to then take it to uh, someone else in the community that can be really excited about what you're doing, and maybe they can take a chance on you. And so um, instead of like oh I have to be in downtown, and I have to get this building. And I have to get licensed and I have to get an XYZ. Um, so there's like, I'm seeing the dream big, but think of ways to maybe also prove it. And then improving that doesn't necessarily mean the sometimes like the very first obvious answer that's in the front of it. If there's a way to also uh, substitute and still make it happen. Gary B called that cloud and dirt. <laughs> We're like, yeah. have that big picture vision, but make sure that you're doing the day to day stuff as well. Yeah. I don't know if I follow Gary Vee. Yeah. Uh, so you had you had a question and then you did as well. You can go first. I'm talking about it. It's okay. Uh, this was more directed towards like Amy and Eddie, but like for any of y'all. So when your company is growing and y'all are like just getting started, you know, how do you know who to trust? Because this company is like your baby, um, really. Yeah. Especially I um well uh, if I yeah. Uh, just speaking on that very directly, I mean, like I, in college, I uh, I learned to, I had to trust people outside my law. So, like I, in college, I made my my first club, and it wasn't like a club amongst friends. But like I want this club to be able to help people with uh, you know professional work jobs and trade skills, and like, again for inspiration and all that kind of stuff. And so I thought to myself, like I had to be, I had to touch everything. And so, um, you know, I created a great team that had full amazing skill sets and ability. But in the very beginning, I had to be a part of everything. And next thing you know, uh, you know, having a reflection on that is like, wow, I bottleneck the whole stuff, like the whole club organization. And so I was so glad that uh, I was able to pass along enough, maybe good lessons learned to the next generation of officers where they're like, oh, okay, well, how do we get rid of like key man rest? Um, personnel. And so, you know, taking that experience and then, you know, add that across the years, um, I surround myself by people that tell me no all the time. And so I, I make sure that I'm never in a place where I created a team where I'm not surrounded by yes men, yes women. I just a yes team. Um, I get encouraging a place that is uh, open environment, communication, et cetera. So how do I learn to trust? Well, I will voice my opinion. Like, for example, I drawn chicken scratch pen on paper diagrams of the MVP. I gave it to my designer. And I said, it has to be this way. And then she's like, no, it's ugly. <laughs> um, and okay, I hear you. And then she'll come back and it'll be a hundred times better, whatever I could imagine. The team is in love with it. And then sometimes I'll be like, oh, are you sure? Can we do some AB type thing? And then, which is perfectly fine. Um, and, uh, Guess guess who the students loved and designed more. Um, so over time, you just like you have to realize that you have to in order to really grow 
and expanding capabilities, you, you do have to lean on, on others too. Um, so how does that trust happen? Um, I think it, it's something that works into the desert. Um, and, but when it doesn't, you too have to acknowledge it too. So I remember when I had to fire my first, um, like one of the first original founding team, um, members of my team, it was not easy, but you had to do it. And so it's, uh, so I've been, been fortunate enough to, again, uh, be able to apply a lot of those lessons over, learned over time where, uh, they able to lean on the strength with others and we end up uh, performing as a team. But you also have to realize too that some point, sometimes you also make a bad decision and then um, you have to be honest about yourself too. You got to think about it. Yeah, I mean, somehow all money is not good money. I'll tell you that. Um, let's just say I I trusted this client to give us, uh, I mean, it was a good amount of over 100K of work that I had my team do. Um, I did that. And then all of a sudden, they pull out and there was nothing. So everything that we were investing in my, my organization, um, did it, I didn't see a results of what I invested in that. So, uh, talking about that, uh, it was very, it was hurt. It was very hurtful, but uh, I think being able, if we didn't do that, then we wouldn't be aware of what was there and what can't be like, you know, what, what could have been and what, is happening um but i think the lesson learned there is that you can trust but also be be very cautious but also have an open communication line and be be honest from the get-go um and be vulnerable uh when you're asking for all that because sometimes uh putting mo that much money <laughs> into one thing um yeah is is a huge risk yeah so every time you trust someone and i don't do something i'm sure for the right what you can do is go to the next person, like the last person screwed me over. I can't trust anyone else. You still, still got to trust them over and over again. You got to judge each person individually and, and let them do what they got to do. I'm a big advocate for small test projects and then clear expectations when you're making contracts with people, very, very clear outline. Um, I think we have opposites when it comes to trust. He does not trust it. He scored a 0% in trust and 100% in curiosity. I'm of the opinion, like, I will let you come on to a small project and however you execute it, it's up to you. Like, how, and, and then, I'll, then I'll evaluate what someone's skill sets are and, okay, they managed to do this really, really well. They didn't really perform in this way that I was expecting them to, but this is, this is who you are. And now that I have been able to evaluate you through this project and I understand like what your own objectives are, my, my goal is really to leverage people's interests and skill sets when it comes to a team. And sometimes they're just not a good fit after that project. They, they realize that on their own. It's like, oh, you, you didn't do this. You, didn't, you probably don't want to do this. You have other interests. That's, that's okay. We can part ways. And being careful as you step into making partnerships outside of yourself, um, especially with larger companies, especially we're very careful about what we put on the internet. Um, there, you do need to put yourself out there, but because we are a hard tech company, um, a lot of my friends with hard tech, it gets knocked off by China so fast. And there's different philosophies about open source and running as fast as you can versus like protecting it. And then we're very small. So by working with a larger industrial company, they can probably defend us on the patent scheme. Um, but at the same time, a large company can eat you and take all of your technology. I had a friend pitch her um, uh, technology to Pepsi and they're like, well, we can just take this right now. And they were very upfront about like, hey, we could just take this and run with this. You're still in the development phase. Um, and so using your sense of discernment, because that, that is a skill that you need to have. Um, and as you as you make these contracts with people, setting up the expectations in the front, so like this is this is what we expect. This is the way this is going to go down. This is how this partnership is going to go. So just as long as the expectations are clear, that'll help you. All right. <laughs> Listen, this is a damn good question. It's a hit home for me because I'm, I'm like you, very untrusting in general. We can get into uh, another day. All right, seeing some stuff. Um, okay. Let me, in my opinion, let me let me give you the high level the way I approach it. To trust people, you gotta trust people. So, part of the journey of being an entrepreneur is you're just gonna get burned a lot. You're gonna get burned weekly. You're just gonna get burned. That's, you just gotta, you gotta take it and keep moving forward. Um, you have to get comfortable with that. Um, but you can't be jaded. So 
you can't really control whether someone is going to like burn you or not. It's really outside of your control. A good book that kind of goes into this is The Courage to Be Disliked. Uh, it does a really good job going into that. Um, but it's, you can't control people. Um, I think the best thing you can do to keep a situation like that from happening and it's still outside of your control is to be pour into people with like genuinely good intentions. Because again, you cannot control what they do with, with that energy. All you can control is yourself. And I think as a general rule of thumb, it kind of um, circles back to that sales conversation we had. If you are genuinely doing what's right by someone, they're not typically, you know, going to burn you. Typically, there are psychopaths. It will happen. But like, as long, it, but business is not about getting every decision right. It's about having a, a, a pretty good moving average. It has to be trending up. You know, if you focus on the day to day, you'll, you'll see falls. But, you know, you just have to make sure that you're doing what's right by other people. So on average, you know, it's not happening to you because you cannot control them. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. I know that's like kind of intangible, but it's uh, it's real nonetheless. This is a very real thing, like a very, very real thing. <laughs> this is like the most like, it's really war. It's like, it's, it's genuinely <laughs> war without like literal killing. People are out to get you. Um, they will backstab you. They have their own intentions. Um, they will do whatever they want to to get to those ends. And there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to, you know, stake out your your area and make sure no one's talking with you. <laughs> That's really what it's kind of like. But you just have to make sure you're doing right by people. You can't control anybody. You got, you got another question? Yeah, I was just going to ask, what do you listen to or read or watch? Like, what sort of media outlets do you stay up to date with? Uh, the Jason Cadden experience. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, specifically, um, every day I read Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, and, um, and, and Reuters. And because I'm out, I like to read the Biz Journal as well, because you can um, specify by the city. Y'all don't have to do this, by the way. It's just what I do. Um, so, but as far as podcasts, pretty much the same, the same brand, but I don't know if I'm going to give you my good stuff. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, to be, I get proprietary information sent to me from our capital partners um, anyway. So I probably spend the majority of my time doing that. But every every morning, including this morning, is what I do. I get up, I work out. I did, I did four 800 today. All right, I got back in. I made my coffee. I'm reading the Wall Street Journal first without fail, front to back. Politics too, like I just read it. I, I, just, I just want to know what's going on. Hey, that's what I do. That, that, that's what I do. It's not secret sauce. That's just what I do. Uh, what about you? Well, what's the secret thing though? Catch me out. I I am right now finishing um, Atomic Habit. Um, I'm reading that. I I wake up five thirty ish in the morning. I do my walks by the water and. I, yeah, I need a clear head before I, I start my day, because because if you're if you're gonna be all over the place, you gotta make sure that you're okay <laughs> mentally, because it's hard when you are juggling like four or five things. Uh, I wasn't the balanced person before, but there was certain things that happened. Um, you know, sometimes it it takes you back that you have to uh, recognize like, hey, what's happening here, and being present. Uh, you have to listen to yourself fully, your body, your mind included. Um, but yeah, atomic habit, walking and jogging by the water, working out, and then being in my office and all that stuff. Hey, okay. okay, how about you? Um, I, I guess from my experience, like going into this, all uh, the Wall Street Journal, they kind of just, they're just there, just such a cornerstone. But then I kind of think to myself, like, you know, what, what's kind of like, what am I in the, in the mood to really? Learn. And so I think a very important question that I didn't really understand until maybe two, three years ago, which was like, you know, how do you learn? And so the traditional answer I used to always say, like, oh, I take a book and I read a textbook, go to class, and whatnot. Uh, but is that really how you learn? And when I asked myself that under new light, I realized, you know, I really do love podcasts. I really do love um, reading articles. I love finding subject matter experts, following them, referencing to them. Um, so for me, like, really depends. Like, for real estate, I always love going to see uh, Graham Stephan on YouTube. You know, I, I just, he just, it's pretty cool. 
uh, public figure that we'd like to have uh, add some great content. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, like world news stuff, I have a tendency to maybe read the, the Guardian. Um, so, it's, so it really depends. Like there are some also like little hacks and bits. So really depending on what you want to really go into. There's like little newspaper articles that you really can go just for anywhere. So for example, I'm really involved in the startups in here. So Techstar Seattle has an amazing uh, uh, news list with all the startup events that are going on. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if whatever subject matter or interest that you have in general, there's probably a local uh, newsletter that has like specifically that. And uh, again, just doesn't take too much digging to find them, um, but you can find them. So, yeah. All right, Amy. There's so there's so many ways to learn. I think you're right, and so and there's so many sources of information. And so finding those places where you like to absorb information, especially in right. your industry, like really look for those local events where they have a panel of speakers. And then the connections that you make at those events are so valuable. So look at the events that are happening around your city that are that you're into and attend those events. Like be a person, be present. I, I spend a lot of time that. Some of them are academic that I attend. A lot of them are associated to the University of Washington or various entrepreneurship stuff. Um, I love content. I love the new, I love the way that TikTok is generating content. I think it's great. So finding people who are um, influencers in your industry and just seeing, being a part of the conversation and the ways that people are engaging in these conversations, like find where they're at in your industry and, and join the conversation. So I'm going to say differently, right? This is what I try to do once a week. I don't do it all the time. I think once a week for 30 minutes, don't listen to anything. Just let your mind take over. Let the creative come. Like if your mind's blank, be amazed how many different ideas are coming right. So me, once a week, 30 minutes a, a week, I try to like, not listen to anything. Drive in the car, just have my brain operate, right? You'd be amazed what stuff comes in your brain. So no what outside of stimulation. What questions did y'all not ask? Like, I don't want you to walk away. Feeling like you had something, but you didn't really want to say. And what time? Your, what, what time is your next thing after this? Next thing. Yeah. I did share with you the event tonight. Okay. In the, All right. I don't know if you want to speak to. Yeah. That. So um, there's a nonprofit called Bunker, the Bunker Labs thing we're going to. So there's a nonprofit called Bunker Labs. Like, so I'm a military veteran. There's all the nonprofit military veterans. Like no. With military health plan jobs, bunker left our military veterans like start companies, right? So tonight at six at that other another we work like half a mile from here. Military veterans gonna get up and pitch some business. Like it's, it's a really good event. If y'all can go to that. But, and um I talked to that who's doing their memory rounds and a lot of good people there too. So I just want to be sure to have like a deadline that could be anywhere. Yeah. What's up? Um well I thought I never got to say that when I moved to Bianca. So, what's up? But in the um, I wanted to talk more about the you know, cannabis industry and like you said people were investing and I've always been thinking small scale, but you know, making something like that and wanting to do a big scale, I'd want to definitely keep the mission alive among all stores if that were to be the case. But more than just like the cannabis industry, I want to like capitalize on helping people understand themselves and their capabilities and what they can learn to help themselves with. And like, I find it hard to, because the business world is so industrial and tech, it's hard to have, find ways to make money off of nature without abusing nature, but like supporting nature. And again, like how things are becoming less brick and mortar and more technical, it might even give more opportunity to clean up the world and like make that, I mean, I could just imagine even like door park for business people. Um, but basically just kind of like, how to navigate that in a city. In a city? I mean, from New Orleans, like how to navigate that at all. I think it's easy for you because there's, uh, I don't think it's a competitive space to what you're trying to do. It's uh, cash. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I don't know, I think you kind of created hurdles for yourself, to be honest with you. I, I think you can do it. Okay. I, I mean, I don't. Okay, and then on top of that, which I hope I get to talk to you all about that later, because since it's not legal in Louisiana, I have to believe that. Mm -hmm. But finding a job somewhere else and like being able to support myself until I can like get in the position to open a business or start talking to investors about that. You know the number? What number? You know what number you need to be making so that you can kind of keep things going yeah. and still work toward your business. I was like, what is it you your means? Like how much are you um so keep your lights on? You don't say it, you don't say now, but yeah, but do you know it though? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't seem like it. 
Yeah, it's kind of wishy washy. Well, I'm okay, so I'm living off of my parents right now. So. Smart. Do that as long as you can. Yeah. But if they're in New Orleans again, so I can't live with, if I live with them for free, I'd say New Orleans, I want to put myself somewhere else in the city after making enough money and pay for that. This is what I would do if I were you. I'm not, but this is what I would do. I will go to the city that has the industry that you want to be in, whether it's right. cannabis or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'll rent a room, yellow car. I would either get like the humble job or DoorDash, Uber, something like that. Uh, make it you, you can make it at least a thousand. Okay. I thought I'm trying to. You can make at least eight hundred a week off of those apps alone, and you have all the time in the world, and you can put the excess money into the business. Okay, that was my idea off of the humble job. Yeah. yeah. Or or at home sales job or something like that, because you know you can kind of get away with anything. Really. <laughs> and easily be making good money. That, you have a lot of options. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That and also network with wherever you're going to. Yeah. That's legal. And talk, maybe talk to them and see. Maybe you can just get hands on experience. Um, yeah. Like I said, you know, rent a room or do the humble job. And do, but you can keep at it. Yeah. And, and um, yeah. I'm pretty sure I met a lot of people this week. I'm sure yeah. all of them have said, follow with me, contact me. Trust me, they meant it right. So if someone said, follow me, and like me on LinkedIn, call me, whatever, 90%, they meant it right. So make sure you follow up with them. To that point. So, all right. <laughs> I really like what y'all have here uh, because I did not have that when I was your age or in your position. I don't know how it y'all. Um, it, I hate using a T word, but I got a lot of trauma from my experience in school because I was an asshole, and I, I, I made it difficult for myself, admittedly. But there wasn't a resource in place as simple as like a program like this. So what Jason said, I want to offer free uh, consultant to all of y'all, no matter what stage of your career or business uh, or what stage uh, you are in your business, or even if you just kind of you, you think you might be thinking about an idea. I want to offer my personal uh, consultant to all of y'all. For free, no matter how long it actually takes, at least for, I'm expecting to be at least for a year. That way, so that I can make sure I'm doing everything that I can. By the way, I'm not going to uh, pass you off to any of the bankers in my company. It, it will be for me because um, it's personal to me. And I want to make sure that I'm personally doing anything that I can with you guys specifically to give back. I only have one ask. Please don't give my contact out. Because I'm going to give it to y'all. Please don't give it up. Um, so does that sound good? Yes. Will you take advantage of it? Mm-hmm. It would behoove you not to, to be honest. Uh, so please do, because it really means a lot to me. I want to do everything I can. Yeah. I agree with him. Uh, you know, I have my nonprofit in the professional development side that does resume uh, reviewing, key coaching, everything, um, and career wise. Uh, I will give you my contact information um, also, and please feel free to send me your resumes. and. I will reveal myself uh, just because I, I know what it's like. It's hard when you're looking at stuff and you don't know what you're doing and where to go and stuff and where to start. It's overwhelming. Um, so, yeah, please feel free to reach out to me as well. And what do y'all do for dinner? I think are we on our own? Okay. Do you have any recommendations? I have a request for Amy. Would you share with your students? What the end point of your R&D is to license or sell your IP or transition into manufacturing and distribution? And if so, how will you target the company and what resources you might need to go either of those things? Oh. So right now we're focused on, we will probably um, possibly license or build the core technology for a large industrial manufacturer. Um, and so the industrial manufacturer builds these giant assembly lines of laundry, um, like large hotels and hospitals will send it to these, these plants. And so there'll, there'll be these tunnel washers, these expellers. And so we would design a module that would fit into this assembly line. Um, we would either build the core technology or license them the core technology. Um, and they would be able to go around and sell it to all of these laundry companies. And so they are a manufacturer of these machines. Um, the long-term vision um, is, though, to kind of redesign um, how people interact with their laundry. Um, and so it would 
be to make um, a, a module that goes into people's homes that changes the way that you do laundry. Um, it would be a system that fits into your closet um, and it would be a different experience when it comes to laundry. So that's the long-term vision. But in order to get to that vision, we're going this more industrial commercial route. Yeah, I ended up too. Like, you met a lot of people. I'm just sure the hard you'll get down to the top. You got to remember, everyone wants you to succeed. Everyone wants you to be successful. So always keep that in mind. And Jason, if I may, uh, if anybody wants to talk to I think all of us are on board. Um, please feel free to share it to. Yeah, I have to pass my phone on right now so you can get my collection code. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we ate it right here. Thanks for all this. I know, feel free to hang out. We do, do what we do. Hey, can I get a picture with everybody? Yeah. Yeah.